I'm Laura Chalkowski. I'm the Associate Director of the Center for the Critical Analysis of Social Difference. I'd like to welcome everybody to the third in our keywords series uh, of roundtable discussions. Before I hand over the program to uh, Alice and uh, the, the rest of our panelists, I just want to say something quickly about the center uh, and then also about the keywords series that we're doing at the center. Um, CCASD is the product of a, uh, an ambitious collaboration among five different institutes and centers at Columbia. The Institute for Research uh, in African American Studies, the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race, the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society, the Barnard Center for Research on Women, and the Institute for Research on Women and Gender. We are an advanced study center that promotes innovative interdisciplinary scholarship on the role of gender, sexuality, ethnicity, and race in global dynamics of power and inequality. Our work is primarily to carve out a space to think differently. We want to think across, between, against the disciplines that are our other home here at Columbia and beyond. I want to invite everybody to look at our website, um, socialdifference.org, to learn more about what we do and also to read about the five different working groups that we currently run, Liberalism and its Others, Engendering the Archive, Toward an Intellectual History of Black Women, Borders and Boundaries, and our newest project, The Future of Disability Studies. So please go to our website and you can get all sorts of details about those projects. Keywords, the series, again, this is the third uh, in this series, uh, really comes out of the work that we do at CCASD um, because each of our working projects is invested in looking at social differences in a wide range of domains and also from a wide range of locations. We can get a lot out of talking keywords with each other. And that was the original impetus for uh, uh, designing this series. Keywords brings into conversation faculty from a range of different disciplinary homes and also theoretical locations in order to explore the ways we think about the ways we use and also push back against some of our fundamental critical vocabulary. So we began in September with a program on ethnicity um, and our last program was uh, focused on intersectionality. On April 21st we invite you to come back for a keyword discussion of the politics of post uh, as in post-colonial, post-racial, post-human, post-modern, just to name a few. So that's our next keywords discussion um, on April 21st. And today we will take on the keyword labor uh, with, of course, the help of our guide and fearless moderator, Alice Kessler-Harris. Um, so I want to uh, just briefly introduce um, our panelists, and then I will um, turn things over to Alice. Uh, Jose Moya, I'll start third in line here. Jose Moya is professor of history at Barnard College and director of the Barnard Forum on Migration. He's written extensively on global migration, gender, and labor. His book, Cousins and Strangers, Spanish Immigrants in Buenos Aires, 1850 to 1930, received, among many other awards, uh, the 1999 Charlin Memorial Award and the Hubert Herring Prize for Best Book on Latin America. Uh, Professor Moya is currently editing Latin American Historiography for Oxford University Press, as well as working on the sociocultural history of anarchism in Belle Epoque, Buenos Aires, and the Atlantic world. John Beller, uh, is visiting professor of women's studies at Barnard and professor in English and humanities and critical and visual studies at the Pratt Institute. Uh, his books include The Tortured Signifier, Signs of the State of Exception that is in progress, uh, and The cinematic, cinematic Mode of Production Towards a Political Economy of the Society of Spectacle, and Acquiring Eyes, Philippine Visuality, Nationalist Struggle, and the World Media System. He's also the special issue editor with Nefertiti Tadiar and Mark Simpson of Polygraph, New Metropolitan Forms. Elizabeth Bernstein uh, is assistant professor of women's studies and sociology at Barnard. 
Her research and teaching focus on sociology of gender and sexuality, sociology of law, and contemporary social theory. Her current research explores the convergence of feminist, neoliberal, and evangelical Christian interests in the shaping of contemporary US policies around the traffic in women. Her research and scholarship have been recognized by awards from the National Science Foundation, the Social Science Research Council, AAUW, the Mellon Foundation, and the American Sociological Association. Her book, Religion, Politics, and Gender Equality in the US, edited with Janet Jacobson, is forthcoming. Alice Kessler Harris is R. R. Gordon Hoxie Professor of American History and Professor in the Institute for Research on Women and Gender, and a beloved and fundamental part of CCASD. <laughs> she specializes in the history of American labor and comparative and interdisciplinary exploration of women and gender. Her published works include Out to Work, A History of Wage Earning Women in the United States, a Woman's Wage, Historical Meanings and Social Consequences, and Women Have Always Worked, A Historical Overview. She's co-editor of Protecting Women, Labor Legislation in Europe, Australia, and the United States, and U.S. History as Women's History. Her most recent book, In Pursuit of Equity, How Gender Shaped American Economic Citizenship, won several prizes, including the Joan Kelly, Philip Taft, and the Bancroft Prizes. She's currently working on a biography of Lillian Hellman. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And I'll hand things over to you, Alice. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And uh, well, all right, I'm just going <laughs> to begin right in. I, I want to start by saying that my job in this panel is to sort of launch the conversation and that what you're going to hear after I finish speaking are three 10-minute presentations. Uh, we hope they'll all stick to 10 minutes. And then we hope to follow that with a lively discussion of the issue of labor, whatever that means or whatever you decide that means. Uh, I am um, a, a little self-conscious about doing this because despite the fact that I'm a labor historian and was trained as a labor historian, I'm not really sure what the word labor means. And in fact, when this subject first came up as a possible keyword session uh, in an executive committee meeting of CCASD, I responded by saying, why do you want to do labor? It's self-evident, isn't it? And it took a little while to overcome my resistance with the help, the strong help of Nefertiti Tadiar, who couldn't be here today. Uh, so I, as, I, as I thought about, uh, you know, after Nefertiti, Marianne, and others talked me into this, as I thought about what it was that needed to be said about labor, I found myself rethinking the idea of labor, indeed doing exactly what I suspect these key word conferences are meant to do, to force us to take a step back and think about the language that we're using and how we're using it. And I actually came to the conclusion that we've come full circle over the last 700 years or so <laughs> over about the meaning of this word labor. So I'm going to start by telling you how I get there, and then everybody else is going to come up with a different meaning for labor that's going to vitiate everything that I have to say. <laughs> but since I go first, I get to start. So I used to think I knew what labor meant. Uh, it meant, uh, as uh, the 13th and 14th century used it, uh, it meant basically a manual worker, somebody who worked with his or her, because a manual worker could be either then male or female. So somebody who worked with his or her hands was a laborer. Pretty obvious meaning, I thought. Uh, 
And we have all kinds of evidence that it was used that way, you know, from Chaucer to Milton, etc. So Milton's famous phrase, um, uh, introducing one of his characters as a wretched laborer that liveth by his hand. And that's the characteristic definition of laborer. But the word has never been what the post-structuralists call stable. That is, even in the 13th and 14th century, it didn't have what we would call a stable or a single meaning. Its meanings were descriptive or tended to be descriptive of forms of toil. So manual labor could take many different forms, among them family labor. So a laborer could be someone who worked for the family, on the family farm, in the family vegetable patch, at the family shoemaking business, a family laborer. A laborer could also be a hired laborer, somebody who worked for somebody else, sometimes for wages, but often for subsistence, for food, for um, uh, a living. Uh, a laborer could be a rural laborer. So the word conjures up many different meanings. It was rare in that early period for labor to be associated with <coughs> industrial labor. There wasn't very much industry. And those who worked with their hands tended not to be laborers in the 14th century sense of that word, but artisans, that is crafts people, and therefore skilled. But even as the word in that period reflected participation in particular kinds of work, it came to embody a hierarchy of value and it's that notion of labor which somehow got um, uh, translated through time. So when you think about labor and you think about uh, dividing it up into manual labor, unskilled labor, skilled labor, each form of labor constitutes not just an imagined activity or kind of activity, but it also conjures up an imagined worth. So manual labor is worth much less than skilled labor. And those are only the easy categories. Now think about household labor, a form in which the word was actually used. In some sense, those forms of worth that get conjured up along with the form of work, are always already typed. They're gendered, they're typed in terms of class and status positions, even if we don't want to use the word class in those days, and they're often typed in terms of racial or religious categories. In other words, certain kinds of people do certain kinds of work which has certain kinds of value. So household labor is often done, not always, but increasingly done by females. It is unpaid, it has no value, it therefore carries no worth. That's the meaning uh, that's uh, produced by notions of household labor. And it doesn't take then very much to make a very tiny leap into the inverse. Household labor, as it evolves in the 17th, 18th, and into the 19th century, is unmanly. It is domestic and therefore devalued. It is sometimes called a labor of love. <laughs> you know, all, all of them words which indicate a lack of value in the Marxist sense of that word. But there are other forms of labor that take on those characteristics. So by the 18th century and into the 19th, we were talking about free labor. What did free labor mean? It basically meant that the laborer 
was free to sell his labor or her labor to whoever would buy it. It didn't mean free labor. Free labor meant essentially waged labor. He could sell it to the highest uh, bidder. Slave labor. Slave labor was unpaid labor. Slave labor was thought to have less value than way than free labor. But pause a second, because if free labor is paid a wage, which is only a subsistence level wage, which is often the case, and slave labor works for subsistence, then applying the term labor to them both may connote a value that is more equal than we would otherwise imagine. So the point of all this is to say that no matter how we construct the word labor, whether we attach it to value or attach it to individuals or attach it to a form of work, labor was in those first 500 years of its use attached to people, to flesh and blood. And then along came capitalism and labor stopped being attached to people and became attached to a function. The individual, the flesh and blood person disappeared and we no longer, for the most part, there's an, there are actually two exceptions which I'll talk about in a minute, but for the most part we no longer talk about labor as a person. We talk about a worker, but we don't, unless we mean something quite specific, refer to that worker as a laborer. A laborer is now a particular kind of worker. Instead, labor became a commodity, a commodity that was bought and sold. So we began to talk about things like the price of labor. Not the wages of labor anymore, but the price of labor. How much could you buy it for? How much could you sell it for? What was it worth when it was embodied in the product you produced? We began to talk about things like the supply of labor. Uh, phrases that indicated that we no longer cared who the individual was or the flesh and blood person was behind the concept. What we cared about was the way in which um, uh, labor, or what soon became known as labor power, was used. Employers didn't want individuals. Employers didn't want workers with all the obligations that that entailed in, and with all the idiosyncrasies that that involved with the need to take care of them after they grew old, if they grew sick and so on. What they wanted was the skill and the knowledge that a worker or an individual possessed. And that's what they began to buy and to sell. So the price of labor was the price to be paid for the skill or the knowledge that they were buying and selling. The flesh and blood mattered very little, except in so far as it was necessary to sustain the skill and knowledge, the hands, if you like, behind the work. So as, as labor or no, let me rephrase that. As the abstraction, abstract labor, became embodied and the thing that people wanted, the physical person drifted further and further out of sight until it became necessary for the actual physical people to stand up and say, as in labor movements or labor organizations, hey, you guys, you know, there are some people out here, right? We are not just the things that we produce. And yet still, the word labor became associated with and continued to be associated with particular kinds of qualities that were sought for particular kinds of jobs. 
which in turn remained or became associated with gender, class, race, ethnicity. So we talked about labor power, and we talk about it as though it has no gender embedded in it. But of course, when we think about the division of labor, which has now become a common phrase, race, gender, ethnicity, religion sometimes are vested in that notion of the division of labor. They're also vested in any notion of labor costs or labor relations or labor markets. All of those abstractions conjure up not individual people, but a stereotype of the kind of labor power that one is buying. And sometimes that labor power is conjured up as female, sometimes it's conjured up as black, sometimes it's conjured up as white male, you know, who knows, in different places at different times for different jobs, the price of labor differs. So the point that I want to make is that the individual has disappeared from our notions of labor. I said there were two exceptions. One is that of the laborer, the manual laborer. So we still use that word to apply to the person who does what you might think of as the lowest level of manual labor, hard physical labor. And we use it in one other context in which it was already used in the 14th century. And that is the labor of a woman in pregnancy we still use the same word, which as it did in the 14th century, conjured up pain was the meaning that translates from one to another, as the manual laborer worked hard to produce his bit. So the woman in childbirth worked hard and through pain. And the word labor is still used in that context. But it isn't used anymore. Now we've replaced it with work or worker, uh, which itself is rapidly sinking into oblivion uh, to be replaced in, in the United States at least by something called the middle class, which is a <laughs> euphemism for work or worker. So um, what do we do then with the concept of labor. Work, for most of us, uh, and certainly for most people who are genuinely middle class, and for most of our children, conjures up not hard physical labor, but some kind of satisfying activity that will also produce an income. That is, settling for work is what poor people do laboring is something you do only out of absolute necessity. So what do we do um, with the word labor as a key word? We use it all the time. We use it as an abstract and disembodied concept. And I'm tempted here now to return to my roots and to think that Uncle Carl, if you don't mind I, I call him that, there was something right about what he said about the concept of labor. That is, it's measured by uh, the value that it produces, but it's also measured by the value that we imagine is present in it. It no longer has its own sense of the energy that a particular individual uses to produce a particular kind of object or job. So that's my sense of labor. We're right back to the beginning of the 14th century, using it in exactly the two ways that the 14th century used it, to refer to childbirth and to refer to the very lowest strata of manual laborers. But I can't imagine that my colleagues are going to agree. So, <laughs> so Jose, I think we decided you'd be next. So, <laughs> can you walk around? And
Well, I was asked to provide the uh, global uh, perspective here. Uh, so I'll go all over the place. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I'll try to both define uh, labor and then global. What is what is global labor? And at the most basic level, I think uh, labor uh, as a keyword distinct from work si simply reflects the history of the English language. It's dual uh, roots, right? That is both it's a Germanic language, but it also has 60% of its vocabulary that is Latin, right? There are very few, if any, uh, language uh, like that. That's why the English vocabulary is twice as large as French, larger than any uh, other uh, European language or any other uh, language. And that's why we distinguish between labor and work and toil and travel and, and so on. You we have an excess of words, really, which probably explains why the linguistic turn had to happen here. We have more words than we know what to do with them. So. <laughs> Uh, but other uh, languages with uh, less extensive vocabulary, uh, th that's true, they, don't, they don't, do not make so many distinctions, but they, they also have the, the same problem with uh, semantic imprecision that we have when defining labor. Uh, labor or work uh, could be defined as any purposeful uh, physical activity. Uh, or mental activity, right? So any purpose, any activity with a purpose, whatever, whether it is mental or, or, or physical, right? Or it could be only physical, and that, that's also happened, even if the word labor is not used. But whatever the <laughs> the equivalent is used, is it only referred to physical or manual rather than than non-manual? And of course, where where is the division between manual and and uh, uh, and physical. I mean, is most secretarial work today physical, or as it is paper pushing, uh, man, uh, mental? Uh, uh, where are those boundaries, right? Or is uh, labor or work only those activities with a purpose, but also that they contain an element of necessity or obligation or imposition? Uh, which will eliminate activities, I don't know, like uh, working in the garden. <laughs> that wouldn't be labor, right? It had to be, you, need, you do it be, not because you want to do it, because you have to do it. That's interesting that we have now the, uh, the uh, choice for some privileged groups that we love our work. But listen, if I didn't have to do it, most of the times I wouldn't come to the office, believe me. So even, in, even for those privileged but you, views... But you write your books. Uh, at a slower pace. <laughs> <laughs> I will spend much more leisure time prima, prima, uh, than, uh, and, and we're probably the ones that come closer to that, that ideal. I think, you know, that there was this wonderful, uh, the uh, Marx uh, son-in-law, who was Cuban-born, uh, Paul Lafarge, and who wrote a wonderful book, The Right to Laziness. And the argument was that all of those, those groups is the counterpoint to the uh, Marxist idea that uh, more industrious people are more advanced people, his argument was no, the reverse. The people who are more lazy and more in, have more leisure, those are the most advanced. Those are the ones who know more how to live. Those are where the, the life is, is an art rather than an imposition uh, and all of that. And of course, Marx says, no, 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 no. I want my daughter to marry a hardworking European gentleman rather than a lazy mulatto from the Caribbean. And, <laughs> But he actually, the daughter said otherwise, and, and she stayed with uh, Paul Lafarge. Uh, another uh, the, the, um, confusion in, in defining the term is, is, is it any purposeful uh, uh, effort that is required or only those that are related to the market? I mean, and nowadays, work is work for pay. Right? Even, even though in academia we, we are trying to broaden the notion of, of labor, it's actually interesting that this uh, calling, giving birth, labor, is particular to English. Other languages have uh, other terms. Actually, Spanish is quite uh, poetic. Giving light. <laughs> right? Uh, uh, Daraluz, right? 
So apparently we, we uh, Spanish speakers didn't, didn't associate with pain, but with future and light and the dawn, like anarchists. Yeah, but labor it is ridden. more labor ridden. Yeah, but it still is not, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, you know, then it goes to the, what is a global labor? If, if we define labor as an effort with a purpose and that is necessary to, to survive, then global ha labor has existed for 200,000 years, as long as homo sapiens have existed. Except that was it global then? Because 200,000 years ago, uh, homo sapiens only existed in East Africa. <laughs> so that's not global. So maybe it's not global yet. So is it, when is it global? When uh, the last big region, the Western Hemisphere, is populated by humans, now we can talk about global labor 12,000 years ago. Uh, or is it global when the people being uh, doing the toil, doing the producing something, were producing for a, a global market, <coughs> in which then we cannot talk about global labor before 1492? And I would say if that is the case, that is the definition, people who produce something, but that the consumers, they're producing for a global market, then the best... Uh, Candidates for uh, uh, the title of global workers will be the indigenous mine workers of the Americas. And the second ones will be the African slaves in the Americas, too, definitely producing for the, for the entire world. Uh, if by labor we mean a class of people, which is often used, labor as a, as a, as a synonym of, of workers, but workers with a, some form of class consciousness, the labor movement, right? Uh, then global labor can only be dated to this uh, second half of the 19th century. And it has a lot of restrictions. Uh, well, it's related to socialists, it's related to anarchists. Uh, if it is related to socialists, well, not exactly, because most of these socialist parties, if you look at their membership, there is a big proportion that are petty bourgeois, and, uh, that people who do not think of themselves as laborers, right? If you, def if you look at the, uh, uh, so it's more of a political party, it's not simply related to, if you look at anarchists, which are more of working class origin, right, and, and have a strong uh, identity, operatist, uh, laboring identity, and spread all over the Atlantic, uh, then you have a, 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 another uh, paradox, that they didn't see themselves as a labor movement they saw themselves as a collective movement for the emancipation of humanity, the emancipation of anyone who suffers. It's very interesting that in the newspapers, they rarely use the term worker or producer. They use other more generic terms, the people, the slaves, the rebels, the uh, uh, apocalypse, you know, uh, the universe. So they, they have a very, it's a very universalistic ideology with the paradox that it has a very strong working class uh, component, uh, the roots. So sociologically, it's working class in terms of aspiration is universalist rather than a uh, social class. And the other uh, a re a restriction to talking about global level uh, uh, in this period is that it's global. Basically, it's, it is the Atlantic world. It's not global. This is Atlantic. It's Europe, the European diaspora, and they're in spread to Latin America. So before World War One. Uh, we can see uh, some of these movements in Bengal, but in, in, in China at the beginning, but it's not tro uh, totally global yet. Uh, I think a better candidate will be, in, after the 1920s, the communist movement, the communist movement. And probably an even better candidate of, to talk about uh, uh, global labor, that is, uh, uh, people who have a sense of laborers and a sense of unity, that they belong to a global class, right, will be actually a... Uh, Third World Socialism from the 1960s, the 1970s, uh, with the uh, uh, related to the C uh, Cuban Revolution, how it spread, Arab Socialism, social African Socialism, uh, all over the world. Now, still, this is actually not uh, uh, truly gro global because there are some groups missing. <laughs> the privilege. <laughs> Now is the reverse of the 19th century. The 19th century was Europe, European diaspora, uh, that was part of this global labor movement uh, in the 1960s and the 70s. These are the people precisely who, who don't feel that they belong 
to that broadening uh, uh, United States in particular. Actually, in, in Western Europe, there is a more of a sense of solidarity with this emerging uh, global movement of workers related to, uh, to, uh, to the uh, third world of socialism. I mean, it is true that there was another strong component here. There was a non labor identity, which is anti-imperialist, right? And, and in many cases, uh, nationalist. But the worker identity, the global worker identity was there and is probably the, when it was the most spread. So then, who's next? <laughs> start with a very brief introduction to me and my work, um, and then um, go into a critical genealogy of the term sexual labor, give you some ethnographic snapshots um, drawn um, from one of my recent books, actually, that forgot to be mentioned, called Temporarily Yours, um, Intimacy, Authenticity, and the Converse of Sex. Um, and then I'm going to talk about what's happened to um, the labor frame within the domain of sexual politics. So. Uh, so my own work looks ethnographically and theoretically at diverse forms of, um, of sexual labor, as well as at prevailing political responses to it. And for the time being, I'm going to use this term, sexual labor, but I'm, then I'm going to start problematizing it um, halfway through what I have to say. But for now, it's the most useful rubric for describing um, what it is that I try and do. So, um, so I've given you a brief outline of where I'm going, so I'm going to start actually um, with just a sort of a little genealogical discussion of this notion of sexual labor um, and where it comes from, both within uh, sociological work, my training is as a sociologist, and within feminist theory. Theorists such as Kathy Weeks have recently provided us useful genealogies of what she calls immaterial and effective labor, labor, and I suspect Jonathan is going to have more to say about that, um, so I'll be brief here. Um, and she's um, helpfully traced these ideas through socialist feminist understandings of women's uh, unpaid reproductive labor in the household, right? Pointing to how socialist feminists aim to expand the Marxist categories of both labor and production in order to inc incorporate gendered forms of household labor. And this is important, both as a location of exploitation and as a site where resistant subjects and alternative visions might emerge. Now, another important theoretical lineage for understanding where this idea of sexual labor comes from derives from the idea of gendered emotional labor articulated by sociological theorists such, such as Early Hochschild. Beginning in 1983 with her book, The Managed Heart, Hochschild is focused on the phenomenon of what she calls emotional labor in pink collar professions such as airline hostessing. Emotional labor, according to Hochschild, and here I quote, requires one to induce or suppress feeling in order to sustain the outward countenance that produces the proper state of mind in others. In her latter works, such as The Timebind and Global Woman, Hochschild has continued to theorize what she terms women's uneasy love affair with capitalism, right? arguing that basically all the flourishing forms of emotional labor and gendered service work are commercialized refinements of services that women used to provide for free. So she gives examples of diverse forms that go beyond housework and childcare, including phenomena such as psychotherapy, massage, nail salons, birthday party planners for your children, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth, right? And most recently, the sociologist uh, Rissel Pareñas and the historian Eileen Boris have together um, coined a new term, intimate labors, right, which is seeking to elaborate upon this theoretical strand that Hochschild advanced, um, but which tries to bring us closer to notions of affective labor that currently circulate, in which affect and sociality, rather than emotions per se, so it's a broader category, are what comprise the spheres of production and commerce, right? And what's furthermore, it's not just a colonization of the intimate model, it's about a sort of productive um, kind of understanding. Um, but in intimate labors, as opposed to effective labor, in their view, um, what they're trying to do is also retain the gendered and spatial dimensions of Hochschild's original model. Okay. Now, while feminist theoretical and political ambitions to create a category of sexual labor have drawn on these lineages that I've just sketched, an interesting feature of this work, I think, is that it's mostly drawn from the redemptive side of the analysis, right? Remember I said there were sort of two components. 
expanding the idea of labor as exploitation and then looking for this other gendered site where alternatives are imaginable, right? So for example, right, for Marx, um, if you think of Marx's idea of wage labor, prostitution often emerges in Marx and, and Engels' texts, right, as the supreme metaphor for the domination inherent in wage labor. Now, when, the, when, when theorists and activists seek to articulate their own nation of, notion of sexual labor, they're actually trying to invert the formula in a way and redeem the idea, right, of commercialized sexual transactions by saying it's work like any other, right? So that's one of the interesting things about this, right? Treating prostitutes as workers, as opposed to other ways of thinking about prostitution um, or sex work, right, has obvious advantages, right? The, the leading alternatives are, are prostitution as criminal activity or prostitutes as victims, right? So the appeal of this model is obvious, right? And beginning in the early 80s, uh, groups like the English Collective of Prostitutes um, said this precisely, and they affiliated directly with movements like Wages for Housework, right? Okay, and sex workers' rights organizations around the globe have continued to follow in this mold from the Exotic Dancers Alliance in San Francisco to the group in power in Thailand to the DMSC in India. At the same time, within the academy, feminist theorists such as Wendy Chapkis, beginning in the 1990s, began to explicitly extend this notion of emotional labor um, to the commerce of sex, seeing you know, whether we could apply it here, how far can we extend it, right? And my own work, in fact, partakes in this tradition. I use Hochschild's notion of deep acting, um, which she describes as a feature of emotional labor, to describe the production of what I term bounded authenticity that's integral to the sale and purchase of sex. Okay, I want to talk briefly now about sexual labor as a political strategy, giving you an ethnographic snapshot from some of my research in Amsterdam. Right, now, so as I mentioned, um, for many feminist theorists and activists, the political appeal of the move towards sexual labor is, is an obvious one, right? From you transform prostitutes from criminals into workers, and you achieve some degree of public recogni recognition that sex work is not necessarily any more or less exploitative than other forms of work, right? Although it is better paid in general, right? Yet when I undertook research for my book, Temporarily Yours, um, after the city moved to legalize sex work in the late 1990s and early 2000s, um, working in conjunction with the Red Thread, the sex workers' rights organization there, I discovered some surprising complexities about the implementation of this new model, right, which suggested that sexual labor might in fact indeed be different from other forms of work after all, right? So while there was initially much anxiety about implementing a labor model, and people were asking questions initially before it was put in place, like, what does this mean if we really treat prostitution as work? Does that mean, like, if you're unemployed and you go to the unemployment office, then, you know, it's listed and you have to go and apply for a job as a prostitute, even if you don't want to? And then, you know, and then th those were kind of silly objections because prostitutes' rights organizations said, you know, there's plenty of jobs that are like that, like a butcher or a trapeze artist, right? Not any person could go and do this kind of work. There are specialized sorts of labor forms. So those objections were not the ones that proved most consequential, but in fact, a rather different set of problems emerged after implementation that, um, that, that, that hadn't been considered. So first of all, despite claims in the press that legitimizing the sex trade would turn the city, um, the city of Amsterdam into a global vice den, the law, in fact, had the ironic consequence of actually reducing the size of the sex industry. How did this happen? Well, within the context of an informal sector industry full of undocumented migrants and virulent rising anti-immigrant sentiment, 80% of the workers who were already illegal, right, and didn't have papers, once it was regularized like any other form of employment, well, then they had to be legal residents of the Netherlands, right? And so they were faced with two choices, either leaving the country immediately, right, or working underground as criminals. So they became criminals again. And so ironically, the implementation of a labor model was the vehicle for criminalizing even the, the, the lion's share of the industry, right? Okay, and what about the small um, cadre of domestic sex workers who were not migrants from other places. Well, interestingly, also for them, many of the sort of small-scale operations were forced to close up shop because when they'd been sort of working informally and it wasn't formally classified as work like any other, well, you could just sort of work together or with their friends. Suddenly, if you were two women working together, you were a brothel and you needed fire stairs and you needed to follow the tax code. Yeah. And it became, and 
lo and behold, the prices fell. So people who could, people I spoke to in this period, were actually thinking of maybe moving to the United States and coming to work here where it's criminalized, right? Where they get paid more money, right? And where there'd be less controls, less labor controls, less regulations. And they'd actually, um, you know, because what draws people to sex work, big surprise, right? It's the high pay, right? And so, and the freedom, in fact, right? So, um, for, you know, for these domestic sectors, and then, and then, um, you know, situations for the migrants were 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 um, related, but 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 slightly different. And I want to talk about those too. So, a colleague of mine, Laura Augustin, focuses um, on the study of migrant sex workers in Europe, and her analysis of what happened there is um, also compatible with one with with the point I've been trying to make. So, she argues in general that. The migrants that she works with are not particularly interested in a workers' rights mo model um, of sexual labor. They are interested in papers, definitely, um, and in being able to um, engage in sexual commerce without being bothered. But they're not interested in sex workers' rights so much, right? They don't actually see it as a job in that way, but rather as a temporary strategy of social mobility in the broadest sense, in which ac economic components cannot be separated out from other facets of the exchange, such as the desire for travel, adventure, for sexual recognition, just like other travelers who combine various forms of travel and work in their journeys. Okay, so that, that was my snapshot. And now I want to say something about recent resurgent discourses of the traffic in women and the effects that they have had um, on the labor frame within sexual contexts. And there are, this is a very, very complicated story. I'm really going to condense it. Um, but you can ask questions later if you want. Now, um, over the last 10 years, there's been um, a very, very powerful resurgence of this discourse of the traffic in women of um, female sexual slavery, so on and so forth, um, which runs directly counter to a labor frame. Um, one reason it has not emerged because of the limitations of the labor frame that I just sketched out for you in the Netherlands, um, but rather for a quite different set um, of reasons and a, a quite different set of allegiances to what you might call sexual exceptionalism, right? And it's, um, it's, a, political, it's a set of political convictions that's shared by many mainstream secular feminists, evangelical Christians, um, and these two groups, by the way, are most dominant in articulating the trafficking paradigm, but also dominant strands of the secular left, um, and others who imagine sex as irreconcilable with the sphere of public commerce. Now, the story of the ideological refolding um, of sex back into the domain of the private, the non-commodified, is, um, I would argue, related to a number of different resurgent forces under conditions of neoliberalism, from the globalization and diversification of markets and sexual labor, to the increasingly prominent role of evangelical Christians in foreign and domestic policy, to the rise of what I've termed elsewhere carceral feminism, meaning a feminism which, which has accommodated itself to the growth of the carceral state and which seeks to work not against but rather within it. While mainstream feminist organizations such as NOW and the feminist majority do not speak directly on behalf of criminalizing sex workers, they no, they, they no longer speak out directly in favor of decriminalization either and are happy to widen the net of criminal justice to include grow, growing numbers of clients, pimps, and other middlemen. So just as the site of work has um, increasingly moved from factory to prison, as many have noted, um, mainstream feminist activism around sexual commerce seems to have increasingly followed it there as well, no longer seeking to develop the paradigm of sex workers' rights and unionization, but rather locating itself within the domain of criminal justice. And as imperfect as the labor frame was in its application to commodified sexual relationships, um, I have to say that this new development is one which few sex workers that I've spoken to have heralded. Hi. Uh, my, my bit's called um, Rise of Visuality and the Transformation of Both Labor and the Form of Value. Uh, I'm going to briefly review some film history and theory and then talk about post-Fordism and cultural production. It's going to be quite schematic and I will fill in as I'm, as I'm able during the discussion. The idea is to take the measure of some of the socio-historical transformations um, in the gap between the conjunctures marked, however inadequately, by the terms proletariat on one side and multitude on the other. <coughs> 
between, let's just say, the factory, the assembly line, <clears throat> and the labor theory of value, and the deterritorialized factory, the screen, and the intention, attention theory of value, or immaterial labor, cloud work, labor, etc. Some of the newer terms. Uh, one, one way to think about this is to look back at the Soviet experiment. In the 20s, you had visual media, particularly cinema, being deployed in an anti-capitalist mode. It was being mobilized to produce the critique of capital and the concept and practice of communism. Rather than working in accord with the expansion of capital, as did media in the capitalist world, and you can think about Hollywood or advertising, these media endeavored to work against capital's sensibilities towards what was to be its supersession. For Ziga Vertov, one of the filmmakers that I study, cinema was a factory of facts, useful in the struggle for what he called the organization of the visible world. The organization of the visible world was ordinarily accomplished by the default perceptual regimes of feudalism and industrial capitalism. His film I masterpiece, entitled Man with a Movie Camera, positions cinema them thematized in the film as an industrial form of the highest order, as the enabler of a new means of socio-historical comprehension via the prosthetic extension of the senses. Vertov used the cinematic interval, the space between the shots, to connect the numerous places, times, events, and actions involved in social production and reproduction, moments which, prior to the cinema, remained invisible and indeed unthought by the masses at large. The making visible of the constituent moments of the social totality allowed for objects to overcome the commodity reification that divorces commodities from the history of their production. And I hope that's a familiar concept. Uh, in other words, by visibly rendering objects as social relations, by documenting their assemblage in the work process, the subjective content of objective products were perceptible, was perceptible. Cinema functions as a remediation of an industrializing world, ordinarily mediated by money, and the forced disappearance of the worker. The objects of the everyday world are revealed uh, via the image as interconnected processes constituted through human activity, something we don't really have the technology to see unless we see dialectically, right? You look at a chair, it's just a chair, unless you know who made it, um, or that it was made. Uh, let's see. At the, at the cinema, the audience is able to see precisely through the Industrial Revolution, since cinema is an outgrowth of industry, and grasp the social totality as a collective product. Film functions as an eye in matter and returns the subjectivity of the labor process to the workers who have themselves produced the world. People see their product as a collective achievement by seeing, seeing through one of their products, the cinema. Vertov understands the cinema as a kind of culmination, humankind with a movie camera, the historical achievement of a platform capable of dialectical perception and a humanization of the object world that is the condition of possibility for communism. So that's uh, one version of what cinema was up to in the 20s. And I'm going to develop this in a second. Uh, another one for Sergei, Sergei Eisenstein, who was an engineer by training and profoundly influenced by Meyerhold and, Meyerhold and Pavlov, film was somewhat different. He called it a tractor plowing over the audience's psyche in a particular class context, uh, capable of conditioning new reflexes. He wrote that forging the audience, the audience's psyche, was no less difficult and monumental a task than forging iron, and famously remarked in response to Vertov's work, we don't need film eye, we need film fist. In his film, most explicitly about the struggle between labor and capital, the strike, Eisenstein cites Lenin's formulation, quote, unorganized, the proletariat is nothing, organized, it is everything. This insight accords with his summary of his theory of montage, quote, the organization of the audience with organized material. The methods for the cinematic organization of spectators were themselves derived from the manufacturing logic endemic to industrialization. The idea was that cinematic montage could create new condition reflexes that would be useful in building the revolution. Workers were enjoined to recreate themselves and their society. In short, the audience was both the medium for the director and the medium of history. Stalin called the cinema cinema director, an engineer of the soul, but these souls were being put to work. So we're in, in a pre-cinematic conceptualization of industrial production. You had the worker on one side and the object on the other. Now you have the worker spectator, that's Eisenstein's kind of innovation or deduction, and uh, on the other side, the image object. In other words, the domain of the worker was extended to spectators who were there to build the revolution, and the domain of reified objects or commodities was extended to images. <clears throat> 
I'm not saying that Eisenstein and Vertov single-handedly brought about this shift. Rather, I'm suggesting that the logistics of perception were being transformed by industrialization, and that these two figures both analyzed and redeployed significant aspects of this historical, political, economic development. In fact, going back to the early Marx and the analysis of the senses, the forming of the five senses requires the entire history of the world down to the present, we can see that capitalist production's encroachment on the senses was perceptible before the emergence of actual cinema uh, from industry. Indeed, it is arguable that the proletarian worker was a proto-spectator and the commodity a proto-image. And you can think about commodity fetishism in that respect. A couple of points now. Uh, for Eisenstein and Vertov, but more generally too, cinema's montage is the abstraction of the assembly line, the chant de montage. Uh, additionally, in claiming the revolutionary potential of cinema, the dominant means of representation is posited as the dominant means of production. With both filmmakers, you have the industrialization of the visible. In short, cinema brings the, rev the industrial revolution to the eye. There are a few consequences to this, to what I'm calling the industrialization of the visual, and I'll just uh, be a little bit too blunt about one of them. The first being uh, to look is to labor, or at least looking itself is posited as value productive labor. Today, uh, in the post-internet revolution, or perhaps it's a counter-revolution, uh, this relation between screen time and social production is increasingly presupposed. This relation of interface between spectator and social machinery, machinery, colloquially known as the image, is also being generalized to other senses. Such a transformation of the role of visuality and media technologies in social production and reproduction necessitated the formulation of the attention theory of value, uh, which reduces to the labor theory of value at uh, sublight or subcinematic speeds. And I'll just say a few words about that. Attention produces value in at least two ways. First, it valorizes media bytes and pathways in ways that can be monetized. Paintings, right, films, war propaganda, advertisements clear clearly, and now uh, in the current moment, monetized on spec through IPOs. Uh, think about Yahoo, Google, Facebook. Um, in my view, these are all forms of expropriation through uh, the privatization of the commons. There's a, they're actually collective products which are privatized and then sold to investors uh, and distributed uh, to shareholders who will then reap the profits of con the continual uh, penetration of these uh, platforms into the life world, into sociality. Attention um, <clears throat> also retools spectators. Right? When you watch TV, go to the movies, uh, listen to this, uh, you, know, you, you learn, get social know-how. Um, needs are produced. You, you develop semiotic and effective capacities. Uh, what is uh, uh, taking place is a kind of daily revamping of the soul or uh, soullessness, as, as the case may be. All these um, above relations could be, and indeed uh, were derived uh, pre-1994, before the internet. I mean, it was there to be seen. And one could already see that the extension of media pathways was, in fact, the ramification of the life world by capital logic. The communist revolutionary filmmakers uh, recognized capital's encroachment on the senses as a site of struggle. Some consequences of this encroachment that are correlates to the organization of the world by images and the rise of attention as means of value production are as follows. <clears throat> the increasing power of digital and visual media gave rise to new forms of cultural imperialism which is actually real imperialism uh, by other or additional means. Capital targets not just territory, but consciousness. Geographical, geographical expansion outward is followed by a corporeal corkscrewing inward. Thus, the visual, the cultural, and the digital are marked out as terrains of production and therefore of struggle. Another one. The increasing slippage of the signifier from the signified as a result of the penetration of the life world by images. Linguistics, psychoanalysis, semiotics, deconstruction, postmodernism, virtual reality, and reality TV, which are not ordinarily grouped together, um, are all symptoms and accommodations of the scrambling of traditional language function by the intensification and increasing omnipresence of images. The linguistic commons is put under siege by visual and digital culture. Clarity about the reconfiguration of language function and interiority by visuality along with the recession or devaluation of the real vis-a-vis -vis the inflation of the sign, insist that we consider the mediological basis of some of the other recent endeavors to treating the transformation of the value form and the transformed situation of labor. So I kind of had to skip over uh, an analysis of the um, symptomatic character. 
of the platforms that I mentioned, but one could sort of make, an, make the argument that linguistics emerges as a um, simultaneous with the rise of cinema for various reasons um, uh, orchestrated by the presence of images and mechanical reproduction. And all of a sudden, language recognizes that it's one medium among many and uh, sees itself in the form of an image. That is, the, <clears throat> the sign becomes a signifier over the signified and, ha and is in some kind of intense competition with the uh, way in which images uh, have traction on, on uh, meaning and uh, sociality. So uh, keeping, keeping uh, and, and one can do this for the various movements I, I've mentioned, but I'm not going to try to do it right now. Uh, the, um, but, but I do think that being aware of the uh, relationship between language and uh, the penetration of the life world by visual technologies does help to understand some of the newer concepts being produced uh, by the Italian autonomists and others, uh, and I'll mention a couple of them very briefly. Uh, uh, Michael Hart and Antonio Negri's uh, return in Empire and, and later works to the idea of, to Marx's idea of social cooperation, uh, and they argue for the, what they call the real subsumption of society by capital. This is more or less stated as a fact, but one can wonder um, how is it accomplished? What, what's the materiality of this subsumption? Uh, what is the material basis uh, by which it is, um, is uh, by which sociality is actually subsumed by capitalist production? Uh, Paolo Virno um, uh, argues that capital has captured the cognitive linguistic capacities of the species. He pointedly argues that we are now all virtuosos who perform speech acts in accord with what he calls the score orchestrated by capital. Uh, this precisely, this uh, command of, of linguistic practice is the operation of the general intellect for him. Uh, post Fordist production requires virtuosity for the maintenance of capital expansion. Our cognitive linguistic abilities have been conscripted and expropriated for post Fordism. Uh, there's also work by Lazzarato, Marazzi, and uh, Tiziana Terranova, all who work on this thing called cognitive capitalism, which some of you are probably uh, quite familiar with. Uh, these are um, post Fordist variants in which, by and large, virtuosos accommodate themselves and their situations to the requisites of capital capitalist society, and another term they uh, often use is cognitive labor. And I would say that, in general, this work has a relatively unacknowledged debt to um, Althusser and also to feminism and Marxist feminism, as well as to media theory. Uh, and that's a conversation that, that we could have um, if you're interested in having it. But, but th that's something that is not um, really uh, recognized uh, by the writers that I've mentioned. Uh, however, I, I do think um, one should see that the visual turn, the cultural turn, and the feminization of labor uh, as becoming, being part of the same equation, in which the image reconfigures cultural praxis as a wholesale production site in ways that impose servility and would delimit and even foreclose the emergence of practicable anti-capitalist, anti-patriarchal, anti-racist, and anti-imperialist speech acts. These are delimited, these kinds of speech acts, uh, precisely because, very generally speaking now, the post fordist attention economy still depends upon the patriarchal, white supremacist, imperial, imperialist organization of the global imaginary to maximi maximize returns which is to say uh, uh, that increasingly every ad we see, every page we browse, every email we send, every word <coughs> we say, every thought we think, and every dream we have is part of the production and reproduction of capitalist society, sensuous labor 2.0 or maybe 10.0. <clears throat> the various media are one with capital, and these would script our participation in order to allow capital to think in us and through us. None of this is to say that quote unquote, prior forms of exploitation that are characteristic of feudal serfdom, slavery, proletarianization, prostitution, domestic work, migrant labor, or the labor of survival in either camps or the postmodern slum have ceased to exist. Only that these conditions of dispossession are coordinated and legitimated or disappeared from thought by the command control apparatus of the digital visual via a calculus of the image that enlists our participation in the capitalist, military, media, industrial complex. <laughs> Most of us participate, despite the relatively clear facts, facts that the Earth is headed towards environmental catastrophe, <clears throat> and that two, two billion people, that is the entire population of Earth 1929, are even now laboring to survive Armageddon. It bears asking, under what image or images do they labor? <laughs> 
we're all doomed. <laughs> <laughs> Not entirely, I hope. Well, I don't know. You didn't give us much of a way out. But <laughs> um, okay, the floor is now open for questions, <laughs> comments. Start, Maria. Well, just quickly to John, um, as the three of you were talking, I was thinking like, so where's communism? Where's the story of communism and all that? And I just thought it was so beautiful to bring communism in through Ziegfeld Dope and Eisenstein rather than through some other, um, you know, in some other way. And I thought that was wonderful. My question to you is really, I mean, it's very convincing what you say about the visual turn. You don't see the digital turn as yet another. Turn? Is it really part of the same uh, empire of images, or is there something else going on? And I guess, um, I mean, maybe it's continuous, maybe not, but I, I really see the production of knowledge and commodity through the internet as being, I mean, just one little aspect of that would be the, the collective labor of, say, producing things like Wikipedia. Um, websites to, that everybody can upload to, the, the sort of Web 2.0, 3.0 um, kind of collective labor that, it, that that is involved, which seems to me very different from the kind of image production that you were talking about. Yeah, and that, that's a really great question, and it's something that I've been struggling with. And it seems to me that there are continuities and differences. Um, I suppose, in my view, it's, uh, the um, first digital culture is really capitalism, um, which uh, enables a quantif one to assign a, quanti a quantifiable um, element to any quality, right? And so you have this sort of um, this, this originary abstraction, if you will, uh, that capitalism enables, uh, which has been compared to the Neolithic Revolution. I mean, all of a sudden you can compare these things which are incomparable um, in very specific and direct ways. Uh, the rise of visuality emerges um, after a long sort of processing of um, society and the rise of the industrial industrialization um, and gives us uh, this form called the screen, which, as I'm arguing here, changes the nature of production. Um, with digitality, you get a kind of um, uh, dynamism and uh, multiplication of the complexity of the relationships which are mediated, me one can mediate through the screen, which creates a convergence of prior media forms and a kind of co-functioning, I, I would say. So for example, I didn't get to talk about this, but there are these technologies, maybe somebody's familiar with this Mechanical Turk, um, which is a, a screen-based uh, deterritorialized factory. Uh, you can do small piecework on the internet or even on your cell phone. For example, um, if you speak Arabic, you can translate text and by testing it back and forth and get paid a little bit and that will contribute to your phone bill. Um, that's, a, that's a new kind of labor which is different than cinematic, uh, the cinematic form, but nonetheless uh, required and presupposes the development of the screen, which was um, organized by what you're calling, and I would agree with that, uh, the visual turn. But there, there is a piece of not only what you're saying, but also what I picked up from Elizabeth's uh, comments, in which uh, two things occur to me. One is, this is quite reminiscent of Herbert Marcuse in the 1960s. <laughs> who made some of the people. same, right, but it made some of the same arguments in One Dimensional Man and Eros mm -hmm. and Civilization and other mm -hmm. books in which basically the argument was, you know, capitalism has subsumed or taken over everything, including our senses, and therefore paths out of, paths to resistance, paths to opposition, uh, are impossible. Resistance is part of the process instead of the opposition mm -hmm. to the process. And I pick up a little bit of this in Jose's work when you sort of take the notion of globalization and um, at each step argue that uh, it is not global it is not globalization that produces these different forms of labor, but these different forms of labor that actually construct the, what we're calling globalization at any given moment. So I guess what I'm feeling as I listen to you is locked in, you know, a, a kind of <laughs> sense of what's the point of all this. And I want you to give us some hope. Get us <laughs> out of there, there, there is Hope in fragmentation, actually, and dissentering. Uh, that's, uh, let's not uh, idealize communism. I mean, authoritarian communism, at least, right? Uh, 
no, 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 uh, no, anyone, I tend to do that too. <laughs> uh, like for example, in this case, your, your case, uh, it is the, the process of her actually are seeing themselves and perceive themselves as capitalist entrep entre entrepreneurs rather than, than workers. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, in, in your case, you say that digital is it's, it's another form of uh, capitalist production, but it is also much more different to marry into property which is why all of these intellectual property things are impossible to enforce, or maybe they will come up with the... So there seems to be a lot of spaces. Mm. The more complicated the society becomes, actually, the more difficult it is to have these social control mechanisms that are uh, tight, right? And the more spaces for people to move around. So it's not utopia, yeah. but it's less hermetic. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's difficult to, to I mean, I, I, I'm split because on the one hand, I would want to call into question some of that zeal um, because it seems that as soon as the space opens up, it then becomes very quickly for capitalized or for foes. I and mean, there's a whole monetization of pleasure which is taking place, which is driving the current economy and also disappears all the other forms of struggle which I've mentioned and other people have, have mentioned. I mean, not entirely right, but makes them manageable and um, also marginalized. Uh, and so that, that's one part of me. But the other part of me uh, feels that the reason to make statements such as the one I, I've made, tried to make or to have a panel like this is to um, focus the urgency of the crisis which is of the present and to recognize that what we say, that capitalism weighs on us all the time and weighs on our utterances. And what we say everywhere matters. So there's, 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 a, there's a constant um, possibility of creating a certain kind of distance, a certain kind of, um, of critical uh, possibility, or opening up a collective uh, experience or an emotive possibility which might not have occurred. And we don't know where that's going to lead. Uh, certainly no single person has any kind of solution, I don't feel. But I do feel that these things have a weight and a density to them, and also a kind of historicity which allows them to be interconnected. Uh, and, and so I feel like we're still in struggle. Hope. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have um, a kind of a sort of retrospective hope if, that's, if there's such a thing. But but but, but let me say this: um, I, I didn't give a hopeful talk. That's true. It's not a very hope, hopeful moment in terms of um, my empirical and political domain of inquiry. I mean, I just have to start with that. But which is not to say it's hopeless either. And um, and and. Um, you know what I would say. I mean, this sort of unevenness that was also pointed to, and the sort of the, the, the sex worker entrepreneurialism that you talked about. I mean, you know that in other contexts would not be something that I would you know discursively or politically embrace. But on the other hand, some of the best work, like the Brazilian sex workers organization, is doing that. They have a fashion line, which is really great and which raises money and which is not just about imposing a labor rights frame, but is about like designing. Um, wedding dresses out of little washcloths <laughs> from the used washcloths from their clients and making with big trains and um, they're selling like hotcakes <laughs> and they're on its way of raising money. So, um, so, so um, you know, I don't, I, I don't see hope in the current political discourse and I don't think, um, you know, the, the sort of the hopefulness that um, was previously embraced, you know, a, you know, the labor rights frame will fix everything, but, but but there are hopeful pockets anyway. And I do think that the labor rights frame opened up discursive space to at least get away from criminalization and victimization, because so there's better and there's worse mm -hmm. within the you know, larger domain of the not good. And, you know, and so even if we're in a particularly bad moment now, I think you know, th those other channels have, have been opened up and things can happen out of them. Um, well, I'm not going to say anything hopeful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, just a comment. Uh, I really enjoyed the discussion. Uh, my work on the uh, professional women and uh, sales workers, sales women in Turkey, um, tells me that the, the, the very fact that women's labor is being devalued in the market economy, and the more globalized the world and the more liberalized the Turkish economy is since in the last 30 years, that's what we have been witnessing, uh, the more devalued women's labor is. So this rising Islamic 
discourses need to be understood in that framework because the Islamic discourse, at least for the Middle East and probably in here too, uh, is providing a framework for women where their work, unpaid work, is valued. Where motherhood, and, and probably that's also relevant for the other religious um, frameworks. So the rise, so the rise of um, identity politics uh, has something to do with this devalued uh, work of women uh, in the capitalist economy. Yes. Do you want to follow through on this, or? Okay, so let me just ask you one question, though, and this goes to both of you. So if that's in fact the case, then what we're seeing is, um, I, I, th I think it was Jonathan who described as capitalism as sort of taking over the senses, mm -hmm. and Elizabeth as uh, arguing that emotional labor was this new category of labor. But emotional labor under your rubric, that is, if it is in fact devalued labor, if it is in fact labor that uh, does not get rewarded in the marketplace mm -hmm. in any way, is, uh, you know, only contributes to the necessary, if not to identity <coughs> politics, mm -hmm. it certainly contributes to capitalism taking over the senses in all kinds of ways. So it, this becomes one giant downward spiral. It's exactly contrary to Engel's prediction that when women enter the labor force, they will ultimately find freedom. Mm -hmm. But so. there, there's one, one uh, related to this. Uh, one of the things that have made labor cheaper is the massive entry of women, women into the into paid the labor. labor force, right? But there is another tendence, uh, trend going on that is not so visible, which is the decline of the global population. Uh, in all of uh, Europe, in Japan, now in Uruguay, in Cuba, I mean, every two or three years there is a few other places where the population becomes stagnant and declining. And it's geometric too, the same way that it went boom from one billion to uh, six, seven billion in two centuries. When it starts declining, it's also, so labor is going to be much more dear well, <laughs> in, in the Muslim future. Huh? The, 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 the population growth in Muslim societies, though still dropping, but not still in Still dropping. Not at all alarming. Uh, no, but it's dropping everywhere. The only, the only thing is how fast does it drop? But the tendency is clear, right? So uh, as labor becomes more scarce, it's going to become more valued. And then we will be fighting <laughs> to be nice to laborers and to tell Mexicans, please, could you come across the border? And that, they, they will come. <laughs> Maybe we won't see it, but. <laughs> Somehow. Sarah, did you want to? Um, yeah, it's sort of, I guess, and it's somewhat abstract, but I feel like what, a couple of the words that I felt like weren't introduced in this discussion were in particular with the idea of wealth and wealth of per particular uh, ge geographical distribution of wealth, because I mean, my, in my work right now, I'm looking at sort of the origins of political arithmetic in some ways, but the idea of the, the introduction of the notion that a state's wealth would be somehow in proportion to its labor capacity or the number of workers. Um, but I'm just sort of, in thinking about the sort of digital revolution and this like the transformation of images, I guess the sort of question, the other thing that seems that it wasn't in this discussion was also the, the relationship between labor and purchasing and, and sort of general trends, at least thinking about the United States, in basing a state's economic policy off of stimulating, a, a, you know, maintaining a, a worker, a workforce to maintaining a consumer body, and how that in and of itself is some way implicated in processes of digitization or this sort of increasing uh, use of labor to make it seem as though products are as if in uh, the sort of allocation of labor to creating the impression of something, whether it's, you know, through advertising or media, but also with the concurrent sort of removal of 
productive oriented jobs. I guess that's something I mean, it's a little mm -hmm. relaxed. I mean, I, I can try to address a little bit of that, and I don't know how satisfactory that this will be, but uh, one of the things I've been trying to, to, to figure out is um, the transformation of the value form, which I alluded to and promised to deliver on and actually didn't. Uh, I don't know if anyone noticed. <laughs> but, 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 but uh, I mean, when, when you have the commodity tending towards the image or intellectual property, I mean, all these various um, immaterial or seemingly immaterial forms, uh, which uh, are bandied about, uh, uh, there's... Uh, Consumption has to be something else, right? I mean, that is watching a film a form of consumption, you know, is learning something a form of consumption? How does that relate to, to earlier kinds of commodity purchases? Uh, likewise, forms of payment seem to be uh, in a kind of um, uh, state of transformation as well. Money is not necessarily what we expect when we do this kind of attentional labor either, right? We don't actually have to get the cash payment anymore in order to spend it. If we learn how to say something cool, then we can go out on the street and use it with our friends, right? And that gives us a kind of satisfaction. There's a, a use value to that. Uh, and it seems to me that the this monetization process, which um, I've alluded to, which is very common in business parlance, uh, implies the kind of dematerialization of what seem to be solid objects. And I'm not like moving entirely to the kind of wave form idea uh, in the Heisenbergian sort of way, yeah. but, but, but there, there's something like that where, the, where money is no longer what it used to be. There's always these final registers of accounts that corporations need to do to, in order to display to their shareholders. So there's a process where you have to sort of like numerically indicate what it is that uh, your corporation's value is, for example. But a lot of that is done on spec as well. There's a kind of calculus involved at a, a variety of levels where these uh, intangibles are assigned values uh, that people have to be convinced of are real. And I mean, there, there's also the convergence of the product as being a set of, a, a set of quantities, the, you know, the work being a set of quantities, the, you know, generate, forms of generating capital and finance capital being, you know, all digitized and like a material sort of, so I mean, whether we can man maintain those distinctions is also, I guess. Yeah, just one more comment and I'll stop. But I, I, I think that um, w one of the distinctions that's really at stake here, and this falls out of the Italians as far as I understand them, is uh, the question of whether or not surplus value is still an operative category. And um, there are some who would suggest that surplus value no longer is relevant because the socialization of production uh, has vitiated th that kind of um, logic. Um, I'm not really inclined to go that way uh, because I, I feel that um, one has to continue to explain this increasing um, disparity between dispossession and the accumulation of wealth, which is unprecedented in scale right now and only tends to increase no matter what's going to happen with the population. So one has to be able to um, create a mathematical image, ultimately, of the logistics of exploitation. And, and, so, and so I would want to hold out for um, the uh, the, the stripping of uh, surplus value and is, uh, the ability for it to be accumulated through a process of dispossession. Another depressing. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, okay, um, I, I would want to come back to this issue of of, of, um, of taking over the census. It just by some magic coincidence, just a few hours ago, I was teaching the uh, 18, 18, 1844 manuscripts to my graduate students. Uh -huh. So uh, there, there is this. Um, we have the census. Is a big deal uh, in that um, text. There's this amazing phrase uh, in classic Marx fashion, uh, the forming of the senses is, is the history of the labor of the world throughout the ages. So um, this, I, I, it, I, it's a beautiful phrase which of course I'm now thinking as a result of the, of the, of the really interesting stuff that we're talking about. Um, it, that if we take this just as a for a, as a game, if we take seriously this position, then we would then we would say that that insofar as I mean, since human beings were making history, we will go back to you know your beautiful two hundred thousand years or whatever of Homo sapiens. Um, um, there, what would be a kind of let's say biological uh, capacity to sense has been is has been formed is or is, is under formation so no matter what really this the the conditions are the system the imaginary at work senses are being formed 
Um, to say that they're taken over is really to devalue the, the beauty of this notion that human beings do have senses like, like all other animals, but unlike other animals, their senses are formed by what they do and what the world that they create. But the beauty of the, those processes is being devalued in practice. But, but your argument is consistently based on a comparative framework where you're uh, arguing for a kind of worsening in, com in comparative to what existed before, which I certainly can, well, all of us can both relate to that and appreciate aspects of. But we have to, um, but also ultimately cannot possibly conduct because we cannot really, really get go into the imagination of a surf, uh, you know, or a, or um, you know, or 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 a, or a laborer in the medieval uh, um, context to really, really have a, a sense of what his or her senses are, you know, how they're being formed, what might be, you know. The experience. So the very least I would say is that that without sort of necessarily using hope as perhaps the the noun, the operative noun, but a certain kind. There are two things. One is, no matter what, capitalism will be the means by which it will be undone, if it will be undone. There is no other option because that is what is forming, right? And at the same time, that whatever that there, there's a certain kind of investment um, in that. That, that strange capacity of, of human beings to, to imagine things that are, are, you know, that up to that point are unimaginable. That, you know, that includes all the things that you just mentioned have been invented rapidly, in, right? And of course, we I understand that capitalism always seems to step in and absorb the most, you know, extraordinary invention against it. But this is not by any means deterministic. There's no ground to argue that this is deterministic, that it will absorb everything and always. And, because that would then close the capacity of of of, of imagining. So, so the, instead of hope, it's a kind of kind of intransigence. There's certain perhaps even mad intransigence in the fact that that human beings can imagine things that don't exist. And that there's no way that capitalism can always be <coughs> ahead of everything, or we have no idea of thinking in what sense capitalism itself would be the channel, the means, the medium by which whatever else is to follow it uh, would be now which may not, may not be communism okay <laughs> all of this is bracketed <laughs> by the fact that there is that the planet is under threat yes there is that <laughs> that is the limit. that's the one only one that I'm it's sort of that sort of that you know I think it's um, well okay good. Can I just respond to that? Can, can uh, I respond to that? Uh, okay, very briefly. Uh, yeah, I do. Th I do feel that there are traces of earlier perceptual re regimes that w that are sure. legible, right? I mean, if you look at the um, the form of the gaze in the medieval painting, or the rise of ac axonometric space uh, and certain strategies of representation, you can see that the visual field is actually being transformed by various social forces, and those forces are there to be read. Uh, there's a kind of simultaneity between where the rise of capitalism is identified and the um, formation of the modern subject and axonometric space, all of which sort of happen around the same time. So you do have the sense that uh, it's arguable anyway that perception is being transformed by the it's social arguable. milieu. And then there's Zimmel's work, right, and the whole blase attitude and the calculative function of, of, men, of, of the mind, which uh, changes people's um, relation, relationality. Uh, so what I, all I'm trying to say is that um, the material determination of the senses which Marx traces and alludes to so beautifully in that text and uh, culminates with the phrase by saying that industry is the open book of human psychology which is very interesting is on a course of uh, uh, where it de is developed uh, as a commons right and slowly being taken over as the other commons were by capital and the ver and, and, and I think you're right to uh, to recognize that the purpose of my talk is to underscore the kind of foreclosure that we're, we're up against and and really as I was trying to say before do something to register the enormity of the crisis of the imagination of the sp possibility of the species of the future I mean with that if we don't have a, a discursive models to render that then we don't really then, then we can Go on faith, right? Uh, we can go on faith. We can, we can believe. Uh, there is also a constant here, which is that uh, the level of domination of systems of domination tends to be exaggerated by both the dominant uh, groups and the ones who are trying to undermine them. Uh, rarely, uh, 
hum, humans and, and human groups are much more complex than any system of control that can be devised. Uh, unless you make it becomes tautological, that capitalism becomes this ethereal thing that that is everywhere and you know we it, 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 it determines everything. In, in that sense, yes, but then it becomes tautological. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate that. I actually want to go back to your point about validation because I think that is both what allows us to use the spaces, um, but it's also part of our problem. And I think one of the problems of the fragmentation of our world is I want to go to, back to this question of surplus value and the problem of digitization because I think I, I don't think we've eliminated surplus value, but where it's actually created. Is very is very obscure now, and um, so for example, I mean, we live in a speculative economy. Right? The people, the, the people who make the most money, have no relationship to productive value, productive labor whatsoever. They don't even command armies of workers who produce things. They yeah. command computers that trade securities in nanoseconds around the world. Now there still have to be things made by people because we still have to buy them <laughs> in order for the whole thing to keep going. But this has become extremely disjointed. Um, and even, I mean, just uh, to, to give a very kind of small um, example, uh, I, I have a niece who's a student here, and her boyfriend graduated from, from CIS. And in the engineering school, I don't know how many of us know this, they don't actually teach people to make bridges anymore. They teach people how to use computers to design computer programs for these financial transactions. So there's a whole section of engineering. I mean, maybe there are a few students who are interested in bridges, but where the money is, is in this um, virtual engineering, which all has to do with the financial industry. And, um, and so this friend uh, got a, got, you know, graduated from CS with an engineering degree although he, I'm sure he couldn't build a bridge. And he worked in a, in a big international bank. And in the first few months of the job, um, they, actually, they actually put them to work on these transactions. And they have it, um, how do you say, they've got it calculated into the training that they are going to lose X millions of dollars. Because if you don't press the key, the right key at the right moment, right? That's hundreds of thousands or millions that get lost in the transaction, like if you're trading. So I think that, um, I, I was just very surprised at this, that you know, he reports one day that he lost X millions of dollars, but that's okay because they expect you to lose so much in the first month of work. So, um, so that is somehow all connected to the South Korean contractors who hire workers in China to make stupid things that, you know, <coughs> these images teach us to buy for our children or whatever, right? So this whole chain of production and profit making and labor um, and wealth and consumption, it goes back to this question of fragmentation. So I think the digitization, um, that's another aspect I, I would put on the table, how I think it also relates to the displacement of labor. No, actually, it was, I mean, it's not even, I don't even want to say this because the, it's like the next key word, really. But if there's an uh, kind of an over-reliance on the term capitalism to explain everything, at the, like the buck stops there, then that really opens up another can of worms, which is, what is that? That can do all those things. Right. I mean, it's like, if it's totally explained through capitalism, what... I don't know what we know. It's just what exists outside of it. Exactly. So, so it's just it's just more like it's just the beginning of another like huge conversation that you know I'm sure we're all hungry. But, but it seems like it, that's like what we leave this off in a way. Part of where we leave this off is that we that need to go there next uh, and really engage with that. So it, it, just to go ahead, Elizabeth. I think 
is just somebody who works empirically. I think you can say it's all capitalism, but then do really interesting ethnographic empirical studies of disparate capitalisms and yeah. disparate <laughs> capitalist <laughs> logics. And Prosit, disparate, prosit of capitalism. For example, yeah. or, or, you know, and you know, in, in my own work, you know, you know, uh, you know, different sexualities that are compatible with neoliberalism, right? There's not one. I mean, but the, you know, the economic is always there, but it's not always there in the same way, right? So. But well, that's a different. That's a different thing. I think. They're well, saying, you know, capitalism. You know, it's like. Well, I would say capitalisms, but right. yeah, yeah. There's some. Sarah, just in the digitization. I mean, the, the discussion of of how of, I mean, like Marx is talking about a transformation of the material world that's very much like implicit in, in I mean, in, in, uh, at the center of talking about industrialization and like theorizing capitalism. And I mean, you could, I think it's quite arguable that digitization is initiating or is in, embedded in large scale changes that are material and systematic that are generated, that generate different forms of, if we want to call it capitalism or whatever, but there, that that means to. There are also disruptions of capitalism, the digitalization, like hacking, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. like practices that uh, digitalization also produces that are can be counter to certain kinds of logics. So Maybe not the end of the world, but certain kinds of logics. Yeah, so far this small scale. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's what we have to, I mean, I think we are imagining new things by imagining these media, which are creating us, but we're also creating them. And I think to lock us into a kind of capitalist um, box and as though that explains it, everything is a problem. I think there are um, socialities that are developing through the new media that are, you know, that are different. I think they're different. If, if we just going to think to work and labor rather than the grand picture, there are different ways in which people are leading their everyday lives by working digitally from home. There are different ways in which women who are um, doing domestic labor at home are leading are different kinds of relationships they're able to have because of the new digital media. So I think one would have to get, get more to the micro to see how it's changing, um, you know, sort of the, 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 the qualities of people's everyday lives. Yes, I think if we look at the big picture, we see that, you know, everything gets produced to be bought, but not just things get produced, that people are spending money on not things, you know, they're producing value, creating value for themselves by you know, all the different hits on Google, and then that's your value, like all the different things that you're interested in there, you hit in that, can, then, then you can be assaulted, you know, with advertising. So, you know, that's sort of the negative picture, but the more, but, but a different kind of picture is organization through the new media, um, activism through new media, and also socialities that develop. And I don't think we've really thought what all of that through yet. But what's, in, what's interesting here is how quickly we've moved from trying to understand labor on its own <laughs> terms to trying to making the argument that it's capital in all of its manifestations that produces different kinds of labor and different forms of labor. And really, it's capital that we have to understand, not labor at all, which I'm finding quite fascinating. <laughs> Elizabeth. I was just going to make a small addendum to that, you know, this thread that we were pursuing here, which is, I think, also to say that um, it's all capitalism can apply a number of different normative conclusions, even in any given empirical instance. And I think, you know, one of the spaces of hopefulness that sometimes emerges alongside a critique of labor and so forth is, you know, proliferation of possibilities in terms of gender and sexuality and so forth, at the same time that, you know, other forms of oppression and so forth are, 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 are happening. And, and, and I write about some, mm. some of this in terms of sexual labor, for example, not just domestic workers, but you know, I think you know, sex workers can actually you know, work in better ways via you know, new media. And it's you know, thoroughly you know, you know, thanks to capitalism, which is you know, doing you know, crazy kinds of damage everywhere else, and for them as well. But also, you know, there's possibility and um, disaster all at once. Yeah, but also, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, who knows? Uh, labor has gone on for 200,000 years. Capitalism for 500, okay? Who knows if this is a phase? Uh, <laughs> that, yeah, it, it's impossible to tell. There are instances, actually, and it's, it's, there is instances of going back to labor, but not, not only uh, labor uh, related to the market. 
the thing is that it's usually seen as a failure. I have seen newspaper articles about young men, young people in, uh, in uh, the Denmark or Japan who are not living the rat race. They don't want to go seven years to school and then go to the work and then they want to have more leisure stuff, hang around with friends, smoke something. Uh, I don't know, there, there is many, they say, walk around, look at the sky. And now, this is, this is uh, described as a failure of, 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 of purpose, of uh, uh, energy, of desire or em entrepreneurship. But it's described, it's assumed that that is a failure. Who knows? This is the road to liberation in which people realize that, yes, uh, labor, with two hours of labor a day or the equivalent, we can actually live quite well. Yeah. <laughs> well uh, but you know, the, the question is there, who's the we? That is, if you, if you think about what young people want, like the engineering students who May described, and it's, by the way, about 50% of the half of the engineering graduates of Columbia Law School, of Columbia Engineering School, go into finances. It's what these kids want. Uh, they want to live these lives of leisure and so on and smoke a little bit, but how are they going to get there? <laughs> They're going to get there by creating a digitized something, selling out for a zillion million dollars. No, 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 and these are then, not these type of kids. Well, <laughs> but they're... Kids, I mean, <laughs> 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 I was just an article last week that in Puerto Rico there's a new generation of 400,000 young people who are called ninis. And what are they? Ni estudian ni trabajan. Oh, yeah, there you are, there you are. A form of liberation, there you are, you know. Yeah. You know, maybe Marx finally was, I mean, if you look at, at it, the only hope for Marxism, and, and he was uh, clear about that, is that from the history of scarcity, we're, we're going to move into societies of superabundance, and then, well, if there is superabundance, why would people struggle and, and fight with each other and blah, blah, blah. He underestimated our love affair with the gadgets that we produce that we want more and more and more and more and more gadget and that's what enslaves us I don't, I but who knows so if we have reached a limit both because there is no more gadgets or there is a production of gadgets is low and then what you were saying the ecological uh, there is a finite uh, planet I think that mm -hmm. what he underestimated is the capacity of capital to build to make us love right uh, no, those no, no, things no. To, to reinvent itself oh, yeah. and to yeah. and to accumulate and create inequalities that we have never seen before but, but your point. so okay. that so that the small proportion of people who can and do accumulate the gadgets and so on, the rest of us, you know, it's bread and circuses. It's, it's yeah, but it, it's 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 relative, right? Mm -hmm. That poverty is relative. That is, uh, the five per poorest percent of the population in the United States, uh, they consume at, at the equivalent of the five top five percent of the population of India, or temporarily to uh, the poorest people in the temp percent of the two poorest people in the United but States are probably upper middle class in uh, in 1900. Mm -hmm. So it is needs that have been created. And, and continue to expand and then we work more, not because we need to eat or shelter, but because we need, I don't know, bigger TVs or I don't know what it is, they got it. Ross, but surely one has to acknowledge that for large parts of at least two continents, the vast majority of people desire to be exploited because, I mean, this is the other side of what can appear to be a voluntarist conception of work. I mean, the aspiration to work is, is, is essentially and, and necessarily an aspiration to be exploited in places with 40% unemployment and so forth, where yeah. the, the question of consumption is just a completely yeah. different question. Mm -hmm. I mean, I completely sign on to the notion of one capitalism as determinant of all this multiplicity. Uh, and in fact, existing by virtue of a capacity to manipulate the differentials produced and exacerbated through the differentiation in the international division of labor, for sure. But, I mean, in the last two weeks, I mean, sort of, you know, yeah. I have to give you snapshots. <laughs> of, exactly. You know, a, 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 a 75-year-old woman who is a manual laborer whose task is to break rocks for, to produce gravel, to pave roads, who cannot want to not work. Mm -hmm. And, uh, an innumerable number of young men coming into mining communities where there are very few jobs who cannot want to not work. Um, I mean, this is, seems to be not part of the picture.
that's true. So I, 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 was, I was going to say that when we're talking about capital, I mean, we you, maybe it's just the way um, some of us have been speaking, but you can't say capital without also thinking labor, I don't think. And, and I, I suppose one of the questions that haunts me as I um, engage in this conversation is in what ways has um, dispossession itself become radically productive? I mean, if you've got what? dispossession, I mean, how, how is dispossession itself productive for property? The radical dispossession. I mean, the, 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 the one billion people in the planet of slums, the two billion people in two dollars a day, are, one could think of them as surfaces of inscription in some ways for the industrialists and the image makers of Wall Street who will then sort of describe in a phrase the economic climate for investment in 30 seconds and, and, and conceptualize that population and, and use their existence in their bodies as a writing surface for some kind of speculative activity. So I, I, I mean, part, part of what I was trying to get at was that this world of digitality, this world of images is kind of floating on the surface of, of pain. And, and that um, the, I, I mean, I, I'm all for liberation and pleasure and, and these things. I mean, believe me, I, I really am. Uh, <laughs> but, 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 yeah, but, but one has to, has to sort of be a little bit paranoid these days about, you know, the cost of our pleasure. Maybe we're not paying it, right? I mean, what, what does that mean? I mean, that's what I'm talking about, this haunting effect. It's like, if, if my pathway to liberation and marketing and commodifying my particular descent is actually uh, makes me complicit in some register of my material existence with murder, then what does that, what does that do for me? I mean, and what does that mean for the world? What does that mean for my own practice, my own culture making? That's a problem mm -hmm. only if your source of ple pleasure is a finite uh, quantity or a fi finite entity. If it is looking at the sky and walking around the rivers, you're not complicit with anything, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a question no, of, of material sure I consumption. I know, I, 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 if we are 5% of the, less than 5% of the global population and consume 25, 20, uh, quarter of the non-finite, non-renewable resources of the planet, obviously we're, that is what you're talking about. We're complicit. We're complicit because uh, th that we're taking the share of other people. <laughs> when uh, when th this is the most direct f explanation of inequality. It's not that rocket science, right? But there are forms. That what I'm talking about this this uh, uh, generation in Japan and. The, this is not pleasure and hedonism through consumption. No, but their moms bring them food, and, and Japan's an imperialist power. It was. Yes, so, it so, was, okay, so, so, but so, so, uh, they're less imperialistic than their fathers. I don't know, their parents. So uh, it seems to me we probably have to stop this conversation, <laughs> but that what we've concluded is that the next or the one after keyword has to be capitalist. No, play, no, that's too depressing. <laughs> that's more depressing than labor. Well, no, <laughs> there, uh, well, I was going to, uh, you know, jump a later now, but I was going to send you for particularly an email about this. But uh, the, the Institute of Commercial Society has been doing its annual conference on, on the 29th, 30th of April on the world of capital. Uh, and I will, I will send the program. I mean, CCSD has it already and, and should go to all the constituents. And has been mailed around the university to make sure that it gets further. And yes. I hope to see you there. We can conduct <laughs> his uh, arguments oh, okay. further. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, CCSD.